You are listening to the Foreign Policy Focus Podcast. We cannot wait for the final proof. The smoking gun it could come in the form of a mushroom cloud. Haven't you driven enough people from their homes already? Bulldoze their villages, seize their property and their laws. They had no part in making now working in Libya with friends and allies, we've demonstrated what collective action can achieve in the 21st century. Now the host of the show, Kyle Inslee. This is episode 359 of the Foreign Policy Focus podcast. Returning to the show today is Will Porter. Will is uh, pretty much a weekly guest on the show now. Uh, he is a staff writer at RT, so Monday through fri- Friday, if you go to RT, you can find his news on the homepage there. Uh, covering all kinds of important stuff, and then the, towards the end of the week, I bring him on the show to talk about all the great stuff he wrote about during the week. Uh, so, Will, you ready to cover Assange, uh, a Gareth Porter article, Robert Mueller's statement, and a whole bunch of other stuff? Yeah, yeah. Thanks for having me back on, Kyle. How are you doing? Um, doing all right. Still battling these allergies, so hopefully you could do a lot of the talking for me on today's show. <laughs> um, just another mention here is that you, we really appreciate it if you could share the show uh, find it online at the Libertarian Institute. Uh, I publish there. Will publishes there. The show's on the ho- homepage in the right-hand column. So really easy to find a whole bunch of our work there and, and make sure you go to that website. So, Will, the first thing we have today is what's pretty much turned to, into a weekly Julian Assange watch as he, um, you know, is battling in the UK prison now, hoping to get some freedom, uh, under imprisonment 50 weeks for a bail violation sentence in the uk you know it's absolutely unheard of persecution and the judge personally attacked him at his trial uh but while he sits in the uk jail for violating his bail there's some other things going on in sweden uh, a country where he's been accused of sexual assault and in the past there's been some uh, possibility of Sweden extraditing him in an attempt to question him about this crime. So, Will, I'll go ahead and let you take it from there. Yeah, sure. So uh, you laid out a lot of the context behind this. And so on Monday, uh, Sweden held a hearing related to these outstanding sexual assault allegations against Julian Assange. And they were to, this hearing was to determine if the government could detain him in absentia, they called it, which basically would have allowed them to like issue an arrest warrant and proceed with their, their extradition attempt, as far as I understand. And uh, Julian Assange initially requested that this hearing be delayed, uh, citing his like ill health because he's apparently in pretty bad shape right now, uh, like in terms of uh, his health. Um, but that was turned down and they went through with the hearing anyway. But fortunately, uh, the verdict handed down was actually sort of somewhat beneficial to Assange's cause as the judge actually struck down the request to, to hold him in absentia. And so it's not it's still not totally clear to me that uh, this prosecutor has no other avenues to, to appeal this or you know to get Assange extradited. But at least for now, the attempt has failed and that Assange is not going to be forcibly sent to Sweden anytime soon, at least. Um, and as you mentioned, Assange, Assange is in jail right now in England in the Belmarsh prison. And uh, I think just today, actually, some photos recently leaked of him uh, looking pretty like frail and skeletal and sick. Uh, and I forget if it was his lawyers or WikiLeaks spokespeople, but they were somebody close to Assange is saying that he's not eating normally uh, because of whatever his health issue is. Um, and so that was sort of unfortunate to see. But the good news for now is that Assange will stay put. Um, I, like, I think if, if Sweden had nabbed him, if they had uh, if this had gone through, uh, the chances might have gone up that he ultimately would have been sent to the U.S. Because like the laws of how we've talked about this on the show before, but the extradition laws are different between the U.K. and the, and Sweden, where in the U.K. it has to also be a law in the books there if, if some foreign country wants to extradite you for a crime, uh, whereas Sweden, I think that's different. And so ultimately, I think it is a good thing that, like, you know, given the the current situation, it's a silver lining, at least, that he's going to remain in the UK. You know what? I find one of the most interesting things here is that the realization that this, you know, uh, hearing for the extradition that was rejected wasn't even, you know, to arrest Julian Assange because he's been charged with rape, but simply to question him. They want extradite him to question him. Uh, right. If we remember back to 2010, I believe. He was actually in Sweden, you know, when these allegations surfaced and talked to Swedish authorities before leaving the country. And they said, no, it was, you know, clear for him to leave. And then once he got to the UK, they issued an extradition for him, uh, you know, to come back to Sweden. And so it's kind of ridiculous how that whole thing ends up working out there. But 
if you think about this, you know, this has been ongoing for nine years now. And if there are actually two victims here, they've been without justice, I suppose. And if all you want to do is question him, like they've known where Julian Assange is this entire time. Like this man's position has been known more probably than anybody else in the past nine years. Like everybody knew exactly where he was with like in a 10 foot radius (laughs) (laughs) every single day for the past nine years. Yeah, very few people spend that much time in a single building. Like, if they wanted to get a hold of this guy, they should have, you know, very easily been able to. But it seems to me, and I think Assange has made the same argument, that this whole sexual assault thing really is kind of a pretext for extradition so that ultimately they can, you know, get him sent to the United States. I believe that is what Assange has has argued for some time. And in fact, that's like, I think that was his reasoning for saying that, look, I'm willing to talk to uh, Swedish authorities and to answer questions about this, but I don't want to risk being extradited to the United States where I'm wanted for political crimes and wanted for my reporting. And so I think that's been Assange's rationale this whole time. So uh, this seems uh, more like good news to me, Will, for Assange. Uh, It's been a while since there's been anything uh, this positive at least the way I look at it, uh, I think it's kind of uplifting, and you know that he probably have a better chance of somewhat fair trial in the UK over Sweden. You know where they're even concerned about him just being renditioned, not even extradited, like through a legal process. Um, and then uh, the last thing I have here is a possible appeal. I know uh, you know the the prosecutor apparently has that option open to her uh, if you know she she decides to go the path of appealing. But it didn't necessarily seem like that was a foregone conclusion. Uh, so maybe the, this whole thing dies here. And uh, the only thing Assange is now battling is the U.S. extradition request. Yeah, I, I suppose the last thing I would add here, too, is that I believe the judge in in the statement they gave uh, uh, shooting down this decision or shooting down this attempt to hold Assange in absentia. They cited and said like the argument was that this is disproportionate. Uh, and so I don't think that's just like some legal technicality. That sounds like a pretty strong argument against this happening. Right. And, well, and there's been a lot of strong statements recently, including the U.N. Rapporteur on torture. And I talked about that on, on the show in the past week. But that was an absolutely, you know, brutal statement towards, uh, you know, kind of the U.S., the U.K., Sweden and Ecuador saying he's never seen this kind of treatment of a single individual, you know, trying to isolate him and demonize him like they've done Assange. And so uh, these things uh, I think are positive, you know, for Julian Assange and his fight, and hopefully it will rally more people to his cause and the people of the UK will at least demand that he gets a fair trial. Yeah, absolutely. All right. Next, uh, we should talk about the Mueller statement here. Uh, for those of you who have listened to pretty much everything me and Will have done almost 50 show nows over the past two years, we have covered Russiagate maybe more than any other single topic. Uh, the Syrian civil war and Yemen would be the other two that I guess would be up there with this Russiagate narrative. But, well, despite the fact that no new evidence has resurfaced and all the old myths that we've debunked time and time again uh, remain debunked, everybody is all up in arms again that Mueller said the only reason he didn't indict Donald Trump is because he uh, apparently... I uh, couldn't because that uh, he's a sitting president. So is that actually what Mueller said? And is that actually what happened? Yeah, this whole thing, as you said, there was no additional evidence or even really arguments put forward. It was kind of just like a spin press conference. It's entirely meant to just like, here's now I'm going to propagandize you about the conclusions of my report and then not take any questions about them. Um, uh, so I, I just find it great how, how Mueller uh, like phrases things, like how he words this stuff. He's supposed to be this like legal expert or stuff or, or, or excuse me, he's supposed to be some kind of legal expert. But uh, the way he says stuff is like he says that uh, we could not establish gu- or he doesn't say that we could not establish guilt by building a case with hard evidence. He basically says that we could not prove Trump's innocence and therefore you should probably consider him not exonerated and you should probably hold out suspicion against him, which is kind of the opposite. It's kind of the inverse, the way that the legal system is supposed to work. Uh, I just I have a profound lack of respect for Robert Mueller. I just find it like the worst kind of like Washington, like spookery to pretend to be perfectly neutral and perfectly motivated by just the law and the truth. But clearly he's some kind of partisan here. He's clearly carrying water for some kind of narrative. Uh, He's supposed to be some kind of GOP guy, but at least he's some kind of partisan against Trump, I think. Um, And so just like what he did with his report, I think, is the definition of sliminess. Like he was he was granted all this broad investigative authority to look into the stuff for over two years. Uh, he had millions of dollars. He had countless subpoenas to use. 
And yet at the end, he still couldn't really make a definitive conclusion, kicked off the whole uh, obstruction thing to William Barr. And so, I don't know, I just find that, like, what a rat this guy is. Like, he, st- he couldn't even make the decision himself and maybe perhaps take some blame for not indicting him by the resistance. Because the resistance then shifted all their ire over to, to William Barr because he made the decision ultimately not to indict. Um, and uh, to answer your question directly, I think after uh, your question about uh, Mueller talking about could he indict a sitting president, uh, I'm pretty sure after his press conference, his office came out and, like, clarified here that they said that they were not saying that Trump definitely would have been indicted or charged had the DOJ not decided in this opinion that you can't indict sitting presidents. Um, even though if you listen to the conference, that's like exactly what it sounded like he said. But like he, he worded it in such a mealy mouth kind of way that like you could pull out either interpretation. It definitely sounded like he was saying uh, we, d- we only didn't indict. We would have definitely indicted had this opinion not existed. But really, he was, it sounded like he was saying we wouldn't have indicted either way because of that opinion, but we decided not to perhaps for other reasons, perhaps because we didn't have enough evidence or something. It, it gets very kind of like bogged down in these kind of uh, like competing potential interpretations. And I think this is partially why it's so frustrating why Mueller refused to answer questions. He treated that like he's so, you know, above it all and like he's so noble and, you know, purely just concerned with virtue or something. He's not going to reduce himself to getting involved in the, the, the exchange with reporters or something. But I think that's extremely underhanded. He's the guy who's in a, in maybe the best position to answer some of these questions. And there are obviously burning outstanding questions that a lot of people in the country have about this. And he refuses to do that and makes it like, this is his final word on it. I don't know. I just, I find this guy to be a real rat. I'm not sure if you uh, saw Dave Smith's commentary on this on the show, part of the problem. Well, but he did a great thing where he, you know, cues it up. And then it's, it's not this, it's Comey's, I think, 2002 or 2003 testimony, uh, when he's talking about Ira- Iraq war lies and lying the American people into Iraq yeah. <laughs> in his congressional testimony. So, you know, this guy's a no liar. You know, I mean, there, there's no principle or integrity here. Um, and, and so we shouldn't be surprised that what he's doing now is just confusing what the truth is. You know, he very clearly went out there. And said something that allowed everybody to spin the narrative to be Trump would have been elected had he not been the sitting president. When that's just not what happened. Um, it's clear from the Mueller report. It's, it's clear from the, the, you know, bar analysis of it that the, the, it's just short of it. And at the end of the day, what we're talking about here isn't Trump, you know, not being indicted for conspiring with the Russians, which since this is only will, um, uh, uh, you know, Department of Re- uh, Justice edict and not something that's constitutional. Everybody says the president can't be indicted like it's a constitutional thing, not just some random DOJ policy from a memo. What, what do you mean can't indict the president if he's guilty of a crime and indict him? And, it, you know, if Mueller was really the hero people thought he was, maybe he would have done that. But um, the, the bigger point here is that is is that this is, is an obstruction charge that, you know, Mueller is kind of talking about here and not the, you know, actual conspiracy with Russia. And so, you know, they're, they're claiming that Trump here uh, tried to obstruct an investigation into a crime he didn't even commit. And that's that's what all this is about. That's what all this, you know, kind of analysis is based on. And when you look at like the just uh, amount of blatant corruption in past administrations like you know, I think discovering through the Podesta emails that it was pretty much the big banks that pit Barack Obama's cabinet, like that kind of obstruction and are not obstruction, but that kind of, you know, just criminal conspiracy kind of stuff going on. Like, why do why do we even care about this anymore? Isn't like the genocide in Yemen now Trump's worst crime that he didn't conspire with Russia, as y'all thought for all those years? Yeah, and isn't it amazing, too, how, like, the whole conspiracy thing or collusion or whatever got completely dropped, and then they moved right over to obstruction without missing a beat and, like, didn't lose any of the outrage or anger about it. Like, they just parlayed the rage about this conspiracy theory. Like, that was not – like, they did not back that up. And so, like, they just – they have to be mad about something, so they have to replace the reason with, okay, well, it's about obstruction now. I just – I find it incredible. So, well, I I really wish this whole Russiagate thing would just die at this point. Uh, you know, I think we've been proven uh, right by it. Aaron Mate could write his book and, uh, you know, made some money off of it from his great reporting through all of this. And we could read that in a year and, you know, remember how awesome we did debunking all these myths. But it really doesn't seem like there's anywhere else left to go. Uh, 
there was clearly no conspiracy whatsoever between Trump and Russia. And, you know, when it comes to obstruction and you look at the actual, they seem pretty thin to me. And obviously, you know, Mueller and Barr realized that they couldn't indict Trump on it. If Congress wants to do something about it in the House, I suppose they can. Just doesn't seem like there's enough evidence there to really convince anybody. And what are we going to do? Spend the next year and a half breaking down, you know, if Trump asking some, uh, you know, lawyer of his, if he could fire Robert Mueller, is that obstruction? I, I mean, it doesn't seem like it if he doesn't do it. But you know, this is kind of the crazy stuff that we're going to be talking about, I guess, Will. Yeah, God forbid we have to do that. <laughs> All right. Well, you know, something with a little bit more substance here is the poisoning of uh, the Skripals, which is back in the news uh, because the New York Times issued a correction. This is something that I and I believe even with you, Will, in the past on the show have talked about and we've kind of broken down what happened here. But can you give us a brief reminder, because it's been a while before it was in the news and then talk about, you know, the this recent business with the New York Times? Sure, sure. So let me try to keep this all in order here and, and break it all down. So just for listeners who might have missed this story, all of it, or just like forgot about it, uh, Sergei Skripal was a former Russian spy who ended up working as a double agent for the UK. And Russia discovered this at some point, arrested him, and he was transferred to the UK in this prisoner swap and ended up living in Britain. Uh, and then last year, this guy was him and his daughter, Yulia, were allegedly poisoned by some Russian plot. And they they used some special fancy chemical weapon called Navichok on these two people. And so this is this story is now back in the news because The New York Times has now re- retracted the story um, about this. What I would call a nonsense claim that the, the UK had shared photos with the CIA that alleged to depict uh, like the children that had been exposed to Navichok. And as well as like dead animals who had also been inadvertently ex- exposed to it. And the original New York Times story, impl- like the implication was that the Russian uh, operatives were so sloppy in their work that somehow they used too much or something. And it, it ended up uh, because the thing was that uh, Sergei Skripal and his daughter Yulia were in a park and they were feeding ducks with a group of children. And sort of this is like the genesis of all of these claims about about sick kids and dead ducks and stuff. Uh and so the idea here was that, uh, you know, they fed the ducks and that Skripal had this stu- had this nerve agent on his hand and that he somehow contaminated the ducks and the kids, uh, you know, by interacting with them at the park. The only problem here is that, A, the New York Times is now admitting these photographs the British said that they handed over to the U.S. or handed over to the CIA. They don't exist. That the New York Times is saying that that was not actually what happened at all. Um, because they initially claimed that uh, uh, the CIA director, Gina Haspel, had used these photographs of these, you know, sick and sick and hospitalized children and these dead ducks to try to prove that, look, Russia's behind this. And uh, allegedly, that's what convinced Trump to expel uh, 60 Russian diplomats from the, from the United States last year. Uh, except it turns out that that is not what Gina Haspel showed Donald Trump, that she showed him some kind of generic images of what chemical weapons might do to people under some conditions. Had nothing to do with anything specific specific to the UK or Salisbury or the Skripals. Um, and now even like even before The New York Times made this correction, we were very like skeptical about this story because it had been previously reported in like the, the UK Mirror, for example, and that uh, British newspaper that these three children had been taken to the hospital and had blood tests done and they were fine, that nothing was wrong with them. And that, that same mirror uh, story actually reported that one of these kids ate one of the, like, the, the bread that was intended for the ducks to feed the ducks, that he actually ate some of it himself. And so if Sergei or Yulia Skripal had Navichoke nerve agent all over their hands and that they were handling this bread and then gave it to a kid who ate some, you would definitely expect that to affect the kid in some negative way. And that's like what the what the New York Times was trying to imply initially when they said these photographs were were passed over, that the kids were sickened. But actually, no, it turns out the kids were fine. There's nothing wrong with them. There were no dead ducks and these photos don't exist. And so, um, like, I'll say, too, like, I don't actually know what happened with the Skripal case. Like, I don't have like a great alternative explanation for it. But when things like this pop up over and over and over again, where there's just no there there, where there was a claim and the entire basis of the claim gets debunked. Like, I think you you can justify some skepticism in the theory itself, in the, the official narrative put forward by the, the British government that says Russia definitely was behind some kind of uh, assassination plot here. Right. Well, yeah, this whole narrative with the dots is kind of crazy, right? Because as you're saying that, you know, the script halls get the bread to these kids, then they go to a restaurant and eat dinner and then they go to a park and then, the you know, pass out and apparently die or, you know, near death on this bench. And then the responding police officer, 
uh, become sick with Nova Chode. So the the whole argument that the the dead Dutch and the uh, sick children could have even ever been I- involved in this is completely absurd because hours later is when people uh, a person got sick by coming into contact with them and when they got sick. It, it's, it was really crazy uh, that this even came up. But I like that, you know, the New York Times narrative changes from you know, Gina Haspel used these to uh, really like trick Donald Trump to saying that, you know, she made it clear that these just happened to be pictures of dead dots that died from, you know, nerve agent. These just happened to be pictures of sick kids. Not that, you know, that this narrative was out there. She was trying to convince Trump it was true. Uh, that's a very, very sneaky. Yeah, agreed. Uh, yeah, this, this whole thing is just like the, it's sort of like the UK's version of Russiagate where it's like, it's almost as ridiculous and almost like upon scrutiny falls apart just as much. Uh, but yet has like very significant foreign policy implications. Like these are kind of like both the Russiagate thing and this whole Skripal case are kind of like, uh, you know, domestic stories within, like within the US and the UK. It's not a full, full on foreign policy story, but really it has a lot of implications for diplomacy and trade and foreign policy and stuff. All right, well, uh, next I got this article by Gareth Porter uh, where he goes through and he looks at the the recent claims about, you know, Iran being behind attacks on U.S. interest in the Middle East. Uh, I think the the big three here are a mortar round in Iraq, uh, the, the, you know, destruction of the four ships in the UAE port that you covered in a previous episode in an article at RT. And then a Houthi drone that hit a Saudi oil pipeline. So, Will, do you want to go through and explain kind of why the the holes Gareth Porter puts in the Pentagon's narrative? Sure, sure. So, yeah, it's kind of weird to read Gareth nowadays in Salon. That's where he was uh, published with this. Um, but he had a great one there this week and totally smashing this idea of there's, that there's some um, imminent or immediate threat coming from Iran. Um And now Gareth, Gareth Porter's story is mostly centered around this briefing that was given by a guy named uh, – a guy named Michael Gilday, who's a vice admiral. Um, and Gilday basically just like repeated all the same claims mindlessly about Iran, that they were behind this mortar attack or rocket attack in the, in the green zone in Baghdad and this attack on the port in Fujaira and the, and the Emirates. Uh, he basically just, you know, repeated all this stuff and gave no detail about how he knew this stuff. And Gareth kind of goes over how reporters were like pressing him and he just couldn't answer these questions. Um, but uh, Gareth basically came to a conclusion where this information came from, where this Gilday guy was getting this stuff. And Gareth's theory is that uh, something that I've suggested also on on the show, that uh, it was being stovepiped by the Israelis, by the Mossad in, in particular. Um, and so, you know, I talked about how uh, John Bolton on your show, I believe I talked about how John Bolton met with an Israeli counterpart of his and that certain information about Iran was passed to him, like just a, just a week or so before this whole narrative about a threat emerged. Um, and so you had that, but also Gareth, uh, points out a few other cases like reports in the New York times and stuff where the source is middle Eastern officials, which, which he notes is often like a code word for Israeli officials. And so Gareth basically posits that like all of this Iran intelligence, or if not all of it, then at least some substantial amount of it is being stovepiped by the Israelis and by the Mossad. And this would not be the first time either that the Israelis pushed crappy intelligence onto the United States about Iran. Uh, as Gareth has shown in his reporting and in his book, uh, the so-called like uh, they were called the smoking laptop documents, which purported th- th- these documents that came out like 10 years ago that purported to, sh- to prove that Iran had been working on nuclear weapons. But it turns out that according to the German BND, that actually that that material was stovepiped from the Mossad and it was based on fabrications, fabricated evidence. And um, interestingly, you actually just had Javad Zarif and I don't know uh, the Iranian foreign minister. And I don't know if he's reading Gareth's work or if, if maybe Iran has its own intelligence on this or something, which is maybe more likely. Uh, but he just came out. Javad Zarif came out and said the same thing, that this is a, fa- a Mossad fabrication, which I guess that could be a generic enough accusation against, uh, you know, uh, the the effort to, like, you know, demonize Iran. They could just say, oh, it's all the Mossad or something. But no, I mean, it, it, like Zarif came out just like yesterday and said this after Gareth's port had, report had come out. So I don't know. Maybe he was influenced by that. But either way, it seems like several things are pointing toward the idea that Israel at least has, <clears throat> excuse me, some hand in this intelligence that's hyping up this Iran threat. Yeah. And uh, I thought it was interesting uh, to see some statements by U.S. officials this week kind of saying that, you know, our military buildup. Uh, worked in, you know, we've deterred Iran from acting against us. 
uh, which seems to mean that, like, in a way that, you know, it sounds like they're claiming victory, but I think for the Iran Hawks like Bolton, it's actually a little bit of a defeat because, you know, they're kind of admitting here that there there's not, like, this pretext, uh, you know, for a, a conflict between the U.S. and Iran and that, like, at least for now, it seems that things are settling back down a little bit, uh, which was some good news. And I think part of that is probably because of the work from people like Gareth Porter and, you know, what you're doing at RT, uh, kind of going through and, you know, casting doubt on these narratives. And there's not this massive public outrage that grows and gets out of hand and, you know, demands that the U.S. must do something because a UAE, you know, a boat in the UAE was damaged, a Saudi ship or something like that, or because the Houthis, who are having a, wa- a genocide waged against them, uh, try to carry out a drone strike on some uh, Saudi oil, uh, you know, interests. Uh, that these are completely possible things, uh, you know, without any Iran involvement at all. And uh, you know, people making this clear, I think, help to you know make sure we don't start to build the public pressure to go to war with Iran. Right. Absolutely. And uh, <clears throat> one thing I would say for your listeners too, I don't often give homework to our listeners, but. Uh, Definitely, there was something that happened today that I haven't had a chance to look into, and so this might, you know, mean something for the story. Uh, the Emiratis actually just uh, gave testimony or, or gave some presented evidence to the United Nations Security Council, along, I believe, with the Saudis and the Norwegians, who also the Saudis. Uh, there was a Saudi and Norwegian vessel also involved. Two Saudi vessels, one Norwegian and one Emirati. And so all of these parties apparently presented evidence before the UN Security Council today. And I'm kind of curious, like, what might come of that? Because the Security Council has, like, the power to issue binding resolutions and stuff. So they could, they, you know, are an international body that actually has some teeth to their deliberations. So I wonder if the, the Emirati presentation is going to make any difference in this. Yeah, I'll be interested to see what it is. The only uh, official kind of report I've seen so far is the insurance report, I believe, on the Norwegian ship that yeah. blamed Iran without any evidence at all. <laughs> so, uh, the, I, yeah, not much evidence to it so far. Uh, yeah. Well, I guess to wrap up this week, we should talk about Yemen some. And, you know, not only because it's just important to talk about Yemen as much as possible because it's the worst thing going on right now, uh, you know, a country – that really can't grow its own food, had a food war waged against it for four years and is blockaded, Uh, has an entire population suffering to death, warring groups that aren't making the food distribution any easier whatsoever, helping it along. Um, But, you know, when we talk about it, we always say Saudi-led coalition, but more and more I think that term is inappropriate. And even U.S.-led coalition, while uh, maybe pretty much as appropriate as Saudi-led, uh, there's a lot of other interests that I'm beginning to realize. Uh, major arms sales from the UK and even the UK foreign mis- minister acting on behalf of Saudi Arabia, attempting to pressure Germany into continuing to sell weapons to Saudi Arabia. Uh, we have the sale of some French weapons. So, Will, why don't we talk a little bit about this uh, European involvement in the war? Sure, sure. Yeah. So when we talk about, like you're saying, the Saudi coalition, really, like this implies a lot more than just like a couple regional states like this takes like. You know, as they say, it takes a village. And it, in this case, it really takes like a worldwide community of, of states to wage this kind of war. Um, so really what we're looking at with Yemen is like we have the most powerful international military alliance in world history. Uh, the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, NATO, led by the most powerful global mil- military empire to ever exist, the United States. And they're teaming up to wipe out one of the poorest, most pitiful, like, Countries that are it's totally incapable of defending itself against this kind of thing, trying to just simply wipe it off the map. I really I really think it's not like a exaggeration to call call this a genocide or an attempt at genocide. Uh, there's without doubt war crimes and crimes against humanity. And, yeah, I would say genocide going on in Yemen right now. Um, and, yeah, it's certainly not like the U.S. has. And I'm glad I think it's partially because of the work of you know this show and the anti-war movement that. Yemen has begun to become like a moral issue. Like you can actually see some of the Democrats, some of the more progressive members of the Democratic Party, they're starting to pick this up that this is actually like a thing to harp on. This is a thing that you can attack people for, uh, for being in support of this war. And so like, I'm glad that it's becoming more of a moral issue, but it's not just the U.S. involved here. It's a lot of other countries. Like, uh, just in the last year, French weapon sales to Saudi are up by 50%. Uh, I think just last week we were talking about the, the French activists who blocked um, uh, Saudi weapons cargo, you know, shipments out of French ports. And so in one case, you had these Caesar howitzer cannons, 
which are like truck mounted uh, artillery cannons being uh, produced and f- produced in France and sold to the Saudis. And then also munitions for that same weapons system. You had uh, these French activists filing a legal challenge and successfully actually like repelling that that uh, arms transfer. But nonetheless, in the last year, uh, the French have been selling all kinds of like, um, you know, some of those artillery cannons, probably. I know Saudi has some of those uh, Caesar howitzers already, uh, but also a ton of these patrol boats, apparently, which I'm sure they, you know, use to help like to you know, police the blockade and stuff. And so, uh, you know, yeah, it really does require much more than just a Saudi coalition or just uh, an American sponsor. We're really looking at like, you know, all of NATO or at least a good chunk of NATO being behind this war effort to you know, penalize this poor country. And it seems to me, and, and you know, I, I may not understand this fully, but you know, I've read a lot about Yemen and watched what's happened there, that the worst thing is the blockade. You know, you could kill so many people with bombs and, you know, even when they all gather in the middle of a city at a funeral, we've seen Saudi Arabia kill them hundreds at a time. That could happen. But if you want to kill, you know, tens of thousands and now we're in hundreds of thousands, at the very least, those are like the known numbers are hundreds of thousands of dead Yemenis. Uh, you know, starvation is what is the way they go about that. And so, you know, we know uh, that Saudi Arabia has some naval capabilities, but we've seen French, France sell them all these patrol boats. The U.S. says they're enforcing, you know, the rights or rules of navigation in the area uh, with their ships. And so I, I have strong su- suspicion that there's probably U.S. involved. You know, you know, telling these humanitarian aid ships that they can't go to port and stuff like that. And, uh, you know, this is just absolutely the worst thing going on right now is the blockade and the starvation of the people of Yemen. And, you know, it's supposed to be, you know, the great shiny beacons of light and democracy and human rights and caring for all, uh, you know, the U.S. and the U.K. and France, uh, three members of the U.N. Security Council that are really responsible for waging a lot of this war. And I've read that uh, the Saudi Air Force is actually very heavily relied on the UK. Uh, I believe they're typhoons and tornadoes yeah. are the, you know, the way they name their planes. And there's a massive amount. And so while, you know, we talk a lot about the F, I think, 15s and 16s in the Saudi fleet, uh, there's also a lot of UK fighters there, too. Yeah, in fact, that's what this whole uh, German like arms export ban on Saudi. That's what it had to do with, I think, because because Germany, I think, had some uh, part in developing the Typhoon, I think, or one of those two planes, and that they had some ban on uh, like replacement parts. As far as I, I forget exactly what the deal was, but yeah, the British actually just was able to like get around that and continue selling these warplanes to Saudi. Um, and it makes sense, I guess, for in Saudi's case, like. It is kind of a medieval society in some ways, like the way they're governed by a monarchy and stuff. And a siege, you know, a siege is like the old one of the oldest forms of warfare. It's like a very uh, effective way to, like, wipe out a whole settlement. You know, you don't have to actually put swords in everyone or arrows in everyone. You can just starve them out. And, like, all you have to do is just block, you know, put a blockade up. And so I don't know. It's certainly appropriate for Saudi to use this medieval tactic. But for like the liberal world order to completely endorse this and to completely get behind this genocide, it's just outrageous. Um, and I forgot to mention, too, there's more details about like uh, just just like a week ago, Trump, uh, he like used the threat that we were just talking about with Iran to like declare some emergency as an excuse to expedite eight billion dollars more of arms shipments to Saudi. And, you know, that's on top of all the all the deals they've already inked. Um and so, yeah, it's just it's I don't know. I don't, I don't know where to go from there. <laughs> yeah, I'll add that, you know, that the Emirates are one of the more heavily involved countries as well, being a uh, right along with Saudi Arabia and a, a real backer and pusher. But even for different elements of Yemen, which complicate the war even more, is that the coalition really doesn't have a side to back. You know, the quote unquote rightful president of Yemen in the international order, as enforced by the West and Saudi Arabia, would be Hadi who everybody admits will never be a, the leader of Yemen again. So there's some separatist groups in southern Yemen. Uh, the UAE hired mercenaries to take out the Saudi bat uh, Muslim Brotherhood at one point. So it, it's absolutely crazy there. And to think that, you know, this coalition that really doesn't have anyone to back to the point where they, you know, I think use almost all mercenaries, if not mostly mercenaries in their armies, or, you know, hired Al-Qaeda fighters. So that's what I was um, going to say. <laughs> it's not very good uh, that, that there's really even no one to back against the Houthis on the ground there in Yemen. Uh, yeah, except for maybe some 15-year-old kid, you know, all the child soldiers fighting on the Saudi side. Right. Yeah, and I, I mean, I think there's like one former cousin of Salah that, you know, 
is claiming to be some kind of general at this point and probably has like actual a couple thousand Yemenis and maybe a few hundred or a few thousand like tribal fighters along with them. But the bulk of this army is just absolutely people hired on out of either desperation in Yemen or because they're migrants coming from the Horn of Africa, which is still going on, you know, four years into this war. The the crazy thing, you got migrants from Ethiopia and uh, Somalia and I think even Djibouti, you know, traveling across uh, the, the sea there and ending up in Yemen and then fighting for the Saudi side. And you have Sudanese uh, people that, are, you know, soldiers that are hired by Saudi to go fight there. It's absolutely insane war here. Well, the last thing I'll mention is that on um the, the emergency weapon sales. Now, this was done because. Trump knew that Congress would block these sales to Saudi Arabia, and so he declared this national emergency. It looks like the Senate is going to try to take some action. Uh, Jason Ditz, news at antiwar.com, uh, that guy, the, the great Jason Ditz, writes that the way the vote looks right now, assuming all Democrats are uh, involved here, is 50 to 50. So if we could get one more Republican senator, and hell, even Lindsey Graham's involved, and, and you know, on board with voting down these weapon sales to Saudi Arabia – then uh, we it possibly could be blocked in the Senate. So that would be a real cool thing. Yeah, I agree. All right, well, well, thanks for coming back on the show. Always appreciate it, and, uh, you know, keep doing good work, and I'll hope to have you on again next week. Tell people where they can find all of your work. Yeah, sure. Thanks for having me on, man. It's always a good time to come on here. Uh, you guys can find my work mostly at rt.com. Uh, you can find me on the homepage. I work with the web team to produce the news for the website. Um, to see what I'm actually writing myself, you can go to my Twitter handle, at WKPANCAP, A-N-C-A-P, and I pretty much post like threads with like a list of my articles each day. Um, you can find my other work, though, at uh, antiwar.com, consortium news, uh, the libertarian institute.org, which, which is where you can also find this show. All right. Thanks for doing my plugs for me, Will. <laughs> no problem, man.